Okay, so welcome, and this is be the chapter one lecture for HMP 401 summer. Uh, and we'll, so we'll be talking each, each time, I'll be doing a lecture for each chapter. So this is kind of our introduction to healthcare systems and why are we gonna study US healthcare systems? Well, um, the US, in the US, we spend about, uh, or spent in 2020, we spent about $4.2 trillion. So uh, uh, to be in New Hampshire about it, that's wicked big. Um, or wicked huge, right? Wicked huge. So uh, uh, what is that in terms of our, our expenditure um, of GDP? So first of all, what's GDP? Gross domestic product. That's basically all of the money spent in the domestic United States. So within the United States. <clears throat> and back in 1960, you can see healthcare spending was a little over 5%. It was about 5%. Uh, and over time, it has progressively become a larger and larger portion of uh, our annual expenditures and now hovers close to 20% of all of the money spent in the United States. So in other words, one in five dollars spent in the United States goes to pay for healthcare. And it goes to pay for healthcare in a, couple, in a bunch of different ways, many of which are kind of hidden. Um, so this, this number includes your health insurance premium, right? Now, you college students probably don't pay health insurance, or at least most of you don't directly pay your health insurance, but your folks do. Um, and, and then your, their folk, and even your folks might not see the entire cost of their uh, healthcare expenditure because they're in, they're most likely getting their healthcare insurance through their employer, and their employer pays a part of that uh, uh, insurance cost, and it makes it look cheaper than it actually is. But if the employer wasn't paying for insurance, they'd probably give your folks more cash. Uh, and we could dis we'll discuss some of that later, but but that is in reality uh, what's happening. And you you may hear uh, as you listen to the financial news, you may hear um, commentators talk about wage stagnation, uh, which means that people's wages, the amount that they earn, haven't increased all that much over the last say thirty years or so. I, uh, however, when you adjust for uh, the fact that healthcare is becoming more expensive and therefore health insurance is becoming more expensive, uh, a larger and larger portion of your of the average employee's total compensation is represented by um, insurance costs, health insurance costs, a large portion of which is, as we just said, uh, covered by the employer. So the employer, instead of giving a raise, pushes more money into health insurance to cover health insurance costs. Um, and we'll talk a little more about why that is. But for now, the key here to realize is we have we are spending somewhere in the vicinity of four times as much of our GDP as a percent of GDP on healthcare than we did back in the 60s. Um, so what else? Well, Medicare and Medicaid um, have increased dramatically as well. And of course, Medicare and Medicaid came about in uh, 1965. So our early uh, expenditures, and this, by the way, is in millions. So this is um, 1.6 trillion uh, in Medicare and Medicaid expenditures, uh, uh, not 1.6 million, it's 1.6 trillion. Um, and so back here, it's zero because it, the program didn't exist. And what you can see is very rapidly, it began to accelerate. And these are in, in nominal dollars. Um, so really, it's, it's, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit tricky with, with getting numbers uh, here. But the key here is, it's an incredibly expensive program that has been rising and rising. And as as young uh, citizens, I'd, one of the things I thought we'd do is look at it as a percentage of the federal budget or federal expenditures. So how much does the federal government spend? Now, Medicare is a pure uh, federal expenditure. Medicaid, the federal government pays 
a significant portion of it. So this is um, placing it, placing the total Medicare and Medicaid costs against how much the federal government is spends. So it's a little bit of an apples and oranges comparison, but it gives you a sense of the scope, right? So med between Medicare and Medicaid, they're swallowing up something like a quarter of the federal budget. And then there's a portion of this total Medicaid expenditures is covered by the states. So 33% might be a little high, um, but it's not too far off. So, and then, uh, so Wicked huge, right, is a good way to explain or talk about, you know, the economic impact of, of the U.S. healthcare system. So that by itself makes it worth uh, studying. Um, there are a lot of people uh, employed by uh, the healthcare system. So 16.4 million people back in, I think, 2015 when this data came out. Um, and you can kind of see how that breaks out, uh, uh, you know hundreds of thousands of, of active medical doctors, DOs, uh, doctors of osteopathy, uh, is, is, a, is a physician as well. Um, uh, and they have the same privileges typically as MDs. So you could just kind of tag that on and get up to, you know, in the vicinity of over 900,000 active physicians, 2.6 million nurses, somewhere in the vicinity of 5,000 hospitals. We've seen a number of them close in the last few years nursing homes, health centers, all sorts of things. And then you have, of course, medical schools and dental schools where people get trained. And then you have nursing programs and you have programs like health management and policy uh, that offer training. And so there's all these people that are interested in the U.S. healthcare system, either as people who sell their labor into the field or people who make their living in the field, right? So, um, and uh, or train people to go into the field. So there's a lot of people that are interested in um, the ongoing health and growth of the field. So your book is pretty critical about the US healthcare system. So I'm putting system in scare quotes and I kind of agree um, uh, that the US healthcare system isn't a system in the sense of what your book uh, refers to it. And so I, uh, so I wanted to think for a minute about what is it do we mean? What is it we mean uh, when we say system? And I got this uh, Princess Bride quote that's, you know, always uh, uh, kind of evergreen. Hopefully, you know, Princess Bride. Um, I find, uh, uh, I find a lot of my cultural references fall flat because I'm an old fogey now these days and you students don't uh, necessarily know the same stories that I do. Um, so I, I want to use two ideas, complicated versus complex. And so the idea is, and these, these have kind of technical meanings, but I want to get into uh, the idea of complicated, a system that's complicated is like, could be like um, the inner workings of a watch, right? So you have, imagine this, you're looking at guts of a, of a uh, classic wristwatch. And look at all the little intricate parts. And you could, with enough time and effort, learn how all these parts work, and you could maybe even improve on them. Um, but it, the key here is it could be understood with enough time. And when you manipulate one piece, the rest of the system doesn't change. It might not work, but it doesn't change. And that's really important. So a complicated system is like a, like a watch or you know, a car engine. Um, it's a mechanical system that can be comprehended, that can be manipulated, um, and doesn't change when you try to manipulate it or even just try to study it. Whereas complex, Right, so complexity is this. Uh, complexity studies are looking at systems that are organic, evolving, and aren't mechanical. Right, so think of uh, the biology uh, and biosystems in, say, a coral reef or um, you know a rainforest. Right, there's all this complexity going on, and um, uh, and the system is constantly changing. The water temperature changes, and then all of a sudden you get different kinds of algae and different kinds of algae draw in different kinds of fish and different kinds of fish draw in, you know, other kinds of plants. And it's just the whole thing is, is interrelated in a way that is unlike a, um, a watch because 
the parts change. If you touch one part, other parts change and evolve and, and become different things, right? So if we have pollution, for example, then the coral reef starts to die. Um, pieces of the reef die, then the fishes, fish, the fish types go away and we lose that diversity. Um, if currents change, you get a different kind of structure and it may or may not be good. Um, but it's a, it is a complex system in that it is constantly changing and evolving and responds to manipulation. And even if you just go down there and look at it. So if you're a diver and you go down to look at it, it's going to change. Um, so my argument is the my perception of your book. So I'm going to, let me pause here for a second and just say, your book is pretty good. Um, but I don't agree with uh, important parts of, of it because I think that your authors, the book authors, tend to see healthcare as more of a mechanical system, a complicated system that can be manipulated uh, and tweaked rather than a complex system that uh, does not surrender its secrets easily. So as you read the textbook, because the textbook is going to be the primary mechanism for for transmitting information this semester, I want you to hold in your head and read critically uh, when the authors are talking about policy issues. Are they talking like the US healthcare system is like a watch, right? That can be manipulated like mechanical parts, or are they thinking of the uh, healthcare system as a living organic thing that responds to manipulations and changes. Um, and my argument is the US healthcare system is much more like a coral reef or a um, rainforest than it is like a watch. And so be care so so I want you to pay attention to that. Um, so uh, what do we mean by a healthcare system? Well, broadly defined, right? It's got the components, it's got components of a system and a process that enable people to uh, uh, receive healthcare. So it's how our healthcare system, we've got healthcare being delivered. Um, a more restricted version of that is how do we get healthcare to patients? Um, we're gonna be talking a lot about public health though too. So it's not just about going to see a physician, the healthcare system also includes um, uh, uh, socially provided um, infrastructure such as clean air, clean water, uh, uh, waste removal, and other important functions that create an environment that is healthy and doesn't in itself do damage to our well-being. So, um, uh, uh, so the primary objectives of a healthcare system, according to your authors, are to enable citizens to receive healthcare services and deliver those services at a cost-effective, uh, that are co in a cost-effective way that meet uh, established standards of quality. So I don't disagree with that. Um, my main disagreement with your authors is they tend to want to uh, or believe that the government should be the primary organizer um, of healthcare delivery. Um, and I believe that we would generally be better off with having a more market driven healthcare system. And the reason I'm, I again, go back to it is that fundamental belief in my mind that we should think of ourselves, if we're policymakers, we should think of ourselves as caretakers, as husbands, as in husbandry, not as in husband and wife, but as husbanding, husbanding a, um, uh, a organic system. So caretaking for it rather than trying to forcibly manipulate it. Um, so, according to your textbook, and I don't disagree, uh, the US healthcare system is unique. It's not a system, right? It's not a system in a mechanical sense, for sure. Um, and so compared to other wealthy countries uh, in, in, the, um, in the world, 
it's quite different. Um, most wealthy countries have some sort of universal health care financed in, in directly or indirectly by taxes. They have uh, most wealthy countries have an entitlement to uh, some level of health care. But that's an interesting question all by itself, because yes, okay, you're entitled to health care. But how much? Where do we draw the line? And drawing that line is a little bit different in the United States than it is, say, in Great Britain. Um, no, no other country operates like the United States. Um, and we've got some issues around cost, access, and quality, as do uh, all the other countries in the world. Um, so other wealthy countries have more government involvement in organizing healthcare as a system. So I want to make a point, another point here. If you look at, um, this is uh, uh, the top 10 uh, uh, largest countries in the world. And then I kind of, well, I included 11 Japan. Uh, and then I kind of selectively edited and included a, a few um, uh, more to look at. So when we talk about the US being the only wealthy nation um, that doesn't have universal health care, and again, we throw that word around like it means, like we all know what it means, when in fact, even according to your textbook, it means a whole bunch of different things. Um, uh, uh, if you look at the top 10 uh, countries in the world, the United States is the only wealthy country in the top 10, right? So none of these other countries qualify as a developed or, or wealthy country. Um, and that's not a, you know, that's not a slur on them. That is just, that is what it is. The United States is the third most populous country in the world. That in and of itself creates a level of complexity that a country like, for example, Great Britain, which uh, gets lots of positive press uh, from your authors, you know, is one fifth the size of the United States. Um, Countries like the Netherlands or Sweden um, get lots of uh, praise uh, for providing very progressive kind of benefit, uh, welfare state heavy um, uh, uh, spending. Uh, but you have to bear in mind that, you know, if you're going to compare yourself to the United States to Sweden, we're 32 times the size of Sweden. And when you have a larger population, the complexity of governing a larger population is not linear in the sense that it, you know, if you have one more person, it's one more person harder. When you have, instead, what um, uh, the right way to think about managing a complex system is, it is an exponential growth line rather than a um, rather than a linear growth line. So a linear growth line, it grows at a straight line. And uh, uh, whereas, um, so linear looks like, right, we're talking about growth like, like that, right? Whereas exponential growth looks like this, right? So remember exponential growth from algebra, uh, eighth grade algebra, right? So the line, as, as I increase the number of people covered uh, by my systems, the complexity of managing them rises at an increasing rate rather than at a constant rate. Um, so so it's, that's why it's important to think about uh, the fact that um, the United States uh, uh, is such a large country relative to um, relative to the peers and, and countries that our uh, textbook is talking about, like the United Kingdom being, you know, one fifth the size. Uh, so it's not that, you know, so managing the health services in the United Kingdom is not one fifth uh, as complicated as the United States. It's probably more like one hundredth as complicated as managing in the United States. Uh, and Sweden with its very homogenous population, uh, Israel, well, Israel's got some mix of population, but Switzerland, very homogenous again. So you've got, um, you know, it, it, is a, it, it is important to keep in mind who you're comparing yourself to, right? If you ran an, a, a team with four people on it, um, it isn't anywhere near as complicated as running a team with 100 people, right? So to keep that Keep that in mind when you compare across countries as to what kind of health system they have and how they work.
So the question is, should, you know, uh, should the federal, state, and local governments have a larger role in organizing the U.S. healthcare system? Um, so this is a, a, you know, a policy question. And one way to think about this was to ask an empirical question, which is, okay, uh, if we say, yes, they should, we should have, um, you know, have more government involvement, where could we look for another industry that has more government regulation, more government involvement, and works better because of it? Well, really, the only um, other industry that has anywhere near the level of regulation that the healthcare system has, and it probably actually has more, is financial services. Now, all of you grew up through the Great Recession. Um, you've just seen a pretty major uh, uh, collapse of the economy, um, though that wasn't necessarily because of financial services. Certainly, the Great Recession was. So, does the financial services sector run better? as a result of being more regulated um, than, uh, uh, than healthcare? Um, I, I, I think not, uh, but that's an appropriate comparison because now we're comparing within the United States to a similar, uh, or to, a, to industry to industry within the United States rather than comparing say the United States to a country like Great Britain that is one fifth the size of the United States. So these are, when we talk about studying the healthcare system, right? This is a social science. We need to think about how we are making our comparisons. All right, so some, some um, kind of facts, right? That we wanna talk about. Uh, how does healthcare get paid for? Well, in the United States, we rely heavily on employer-based health insurance. And we'll talk in the next chapter about why that is and how it came about. Um, most, and that is, uh, uh, em so employer-based is mostly private purchased health insurance, right? It's purchased through the employer, but there are a non-trivial non number of people who buy their health insurance and on the individual market. Uh, then we have a very significant number of folks who get uh, uh their care through various government programs. So um, I wanna focus particularly on Medicare and Medicaid here, not so much state employees. Um, uh, that, that is more about purchasing, uh, uh, you know, state employee, uh, state employees are, are basically like other employers. They get, you know, um, the government buys them a private uh, healthcare program. Medicare and Medicaid, however, are um, are actually government government programs, along with programs like Tricare, which is the military health insurance program that I get my care through uh, as a military retiree. So let's look at how people get care. So um, in 2018, so this I got from the Census uh, Bureau. So so in 2018, um, 91, almost 92 percent of the United States had a uh, population had some sort of healthcare insurance, 8.5% were uninsured. And thanks to the ACA, that 8.5% uh, rate has fallen from close to 16%, mostly because we expanded the number of people on Medicaid. So we, you would have heard about Medicaid expansion, uh, and, and New Hampshire is one of those states where uh, uh, they expanded access to uh, Medicare, Medicaid, excuse me. Um, so uh, looking at um, how does that break out? Um, so any private plan, so that would be your Cigna's, your Aetna's, your um, uh, Anthem's and so forth, right? 67% uh, of the country is covered by, um, uh, who, who have insurance are covered by a private plan. 34% are covered by a public plan. So VA and Champ VA uh, in, you know, uh, are examples of public plans. Um, TRICARE uh, really ought to be a, a public plan. Uh, I'm not sure why the census would plug that in as a private plan uh, since it's a DOD program. Um, uh, but Medicare versus Medicaid, this is important. Medicare is primarily for those over 65 and those permanently disabled. Medicaid is a 
is a program meant to help offset poverty. And so in order to qualify for Medicaid, you have to have a, a very low level of income and assets. Um, and one of the things that's uh, interesting and not talked about very often is Medicaid uh, many people are are dual eligible. They are both Medicare and Medicaid eligible, right? A lot of elderly are also poor. And so they qualify not only for Medicare, but Medicaid. In fact, many people who are residing in nursing homes uh, are dual eligibles. In fact, Medicaid, the program for, for um, uh, uh, indigent or poor people uh, uh, to pay for their health care, uh, pays for um, more long-term care than any other program. So it's a major uh, funder of long-term care, though it wasn't designed for that. So in the U.S., um, your book offers some criticism, right? So there's very little kind of interrelated, there's very little coordination. That's kind of the main point, I think, really, is because we have a lot of atomistic actors, right? We have a hospital that operates separate from their, your physician, that operates separate from your insurance company, that operates, you know, so on and so forth, separate from your employer. Um, and so there's very little planning or direction done at the system level. And so cost containment um, is pretty ineffective. Now, what makes the U.S stand out. So we've we've criticized the US. So what makes the US stand out? Medical technology. We have the world's best medical technology, as we just demonstrated with the COVID-19 vaccine. Right. Now we made a complete and utter uh, fool of ourselves uh, uh, early on with COVID-19. Uh, but now uh, we finally got our act together and we have, you know, provided uh, the world with the technology, with the best uh, vaccines. And, you know, as we continue to kind of recover, we'll be pushing that technology out into the world. Um, we have the best medical training. People from all around the world come here to train. We have the best research. Uh, more research, healthcare research is done in the United States that in influences the rest of the world than anywhere else. We have incredibly sophisticated institutions, and those include, you know, your hospitals and healthcare systems, even insurance companies. We're going to talk bad about insurance companies a lot uh, in this class, but man, insurance companies are really amazing. They do some really great work. Um, uh, we have incredible medical schools and healthcare training institutions, right? So medical schools, nursing programs, right? So like the nursing program here, the OT program here, you know, the HMP program that I'm a part of, right? We have, we are just, the U.S. is sophisticated and the rest of the world follows uh, most of what we do. So while we're expensive, um, we're also leading the world most of the time. So uh, some characteristics of uh, uh, the U.S. healthcare system, um, you know, we have a kind of a unique political climate. Uh, we are one of, per capita, we're one of the wealthiest countries in the world just in terms of, of GDP, you know, in terms of the amount of, of resources that are generated by any one country. The United States still is the largest uh, economy in the world. So enormous economic uh, uh, powerhouse here. And that, but it is highly, we're highly individualistic as a culture, and that influences the way that we, uh, that all our systems evolve. Um, I talked to quite a bit about population, right, which makes a huge difference. Um, and we'll talk about some other stuff. I'm going to kind of go quick here. Um, so your book offers 10 things that really differentiate the United States. I encourage you to read through this. I'm not going to go through them in a lot of detail. Kind of the biggest single one that I think um, is, is no central agency that governs the system, right? This is a highly decentralized system. Um, a lot of, of reform, healthcare reform would like to see it more centralized. It's hard to say whether that it would actually, you know, add any value or not. Um, and the video, one of the videos I asked you to watch, the one about um, the fortress and the frontier talks about um, how, how technology that is not regulated the way that the healthcare system is regulated has increased in uh, uh, value 
and decreased in cost dramatically over the same period of time. So think about the, the thing I like to think about is when I was your age, um, you know, so in my uh, early twenties, uh, I had a Walkman, right? I had a, um, when I listened to music, I had a Walkman and it played a tape. And the best you could do is maybe get six songs uh, per side on a tape. So I would walk around the Walkman um, with 12 songs on it. And um, I couldn't instantly skip from one song to another. I basically had to listen to the whole side and then go to the other side. You know, just think about, you know, I just got Spotify the other day. Um, you know, my kids have been on me about it and I finally got Spotify for the family and I've got access to millions of songs, right? And I've got them on my phone. Um, and, you know, and then I've got a cell phone, right? All these things that are just, in, you know, the cost 30 years ago to have the amount, to have the music library that I have today through Spotify for $15 a month would have cost me millions of dollars, right? I mean, just hands down, I couldn't have done it. Maybe not millions, hundred thousand dollars, right? Today it cost me $15 a, a month. And I'm, and I'm kind of mad about that. Like, I feel like it ought to be cheaper. So there are second order effects when you have, when you turn over control, um, you don't get benefits of the market and the way that the market works to bring about innovation. So you sacrifice innovation for control. Maybe it's good to have more control. Maybe it isn't. It's hard to, you know, uh, it depends on what you value. Um, so a bunch of issues here uh, uh, that you need to read through more, more carefully. I do want to talk a little bit about this quad function model. This is really important. This I would really like you to make sure you understand and have a good handle on uh, for the exam. So the quad function model says healthcare delivery basically boils down to four functions. The first one is financing. So this is different than payment and it's different than insurance. This is where does the money come from to pay for, um, for care, right? And so mostly it's either private, entirely private, um, in the sense that you purchase your own care out of your own pocket. Uh, you may have some sort of cost sharing through an employer. So then it is partly the employer paying financing, partly you financing, but in reality, it's all you financing because the employer would just pay you more cash if they didn't have to pay for your uh, health insurance. Um, or you can, the financing can come generally speaking, from the government. And the government, when I use government, I don't just mean federal government. It also can come from the state uh, and potentially local government, uh, depending on what kind of health services we're talking about. And most public health services are funded by the local and state government. So, you know, um, uh, sanitation, um, clean water, those sorts of things are taken care of by the state and local governments. Um, and so the financing for that comes from taxes. The financing for Medicare mostly comes from taxes, though you pay a small, uh, relatively speaking, small portion of it directly as a citizen. So the first piece of this is where does the money come from to pay for healthcare? That's financing. Insurance there's an insurance function, um, and that is to protect against catastrophic risk. In sh most healthcare is a mix of, of real insurance and um, prepaid services. So, for example, if you pay um, under the ACA, uh, you are entitled to a um, no-cost uh, immunization. You're entitled to no cost immunizations. You're entitled to no cost annual physicals. Well, those, just because the government waved its hand and said, the insurance company can't charge you for it. And they, but then said, then turned around and said, they have to provide it uh, or fund it. All they do is they take the cost of, um, of, of an annual physical and they put it into your insurance premium. So if your insurance premium used to be, say, $1,000 a year, and the government said, oh, you know, now you have insurance company, you now have to pay for a free um, uh, uh, annual physical for an employee, uh, for, for, in, 
for anyone you insure. And that annual physical is going to cost on average $100. All the insurance company does is raise your premium from 1000 to 1100. It doesn't make the it doesn't make the annual physical free. It just moves where the cost is. Same with birth control, same with, like I said, immunizations, same with, you know, screening colonoscopies. I turned 50 this year and got my first chance to have a screening colonoscopy. It was good times had by all. Um, so insurance really, the insurance function is really about catastrophic risk. So think about this. You don't buy um, uh, oil change insurance from your uh, insurance company right from your from your auto insurance company if you have a car and you have auto insurance you don't buy uh oil change insurance right that's just silly uh you just pay the the oil change out of pocket what you have auto insurance for is if you crash your car and you hurt somebody badly and it's going to cost a hundred thousand dollars in in uh, medical bills or you crash your car and you can't afford to replace your you have a you can't afford to replace your car out of pocket, so you have collision insurance that if you total your car, the in, in insurance company gives you a check for the value of your car, and then you can go buy a new one. That's catastrophic protecting against catastrophic risk. Prepaid, there's a prepaid component to most health insurance now. That's more like um, uh, prepaying for uh, uh, oil change, oil changes, right? So. The average insurance company knows that you're going to have four or five uh, visits per year, and so and and they know roughly what those cost, and so they uh, roll that into your uh, annual premium, um, and that becomes prepaid services. It's not really insurance. And we'll be talking more about that, but insurance. The key here to remember is insurance is meant to protect you against catastrophic things. Everything else is just prepaid expenditures. So delivery, somebody is actually doing the healthcare to you, right? Um, so, you know, a physician, the, your family medicine physician, uh, a hospital, those are providers. They are providing services. So there's delivery. And then finally, after the service has been paid, somebody pays. Typically, that's the insurance company uh, makes the actual payment. And the insurance company decides uh uh, or, you know, your book says they decide how much to reimburse. That's not actually accurate. It is a negotiation between the provider who is delivering the care um, and the insurance company who is making the payment on your behalf. Um, and so we'll talk more about that as well. Uh, but payment is, uh, is that reimbursement to the provider for uh, the services you've rendered. So there's four functions, right? There is the financing. Where does the money come from? You or does it come from taxpayers uh, in your community? Insurance. Insurance function is um, the organization that provides against catastrophic risk uh, or, or catastrophic outcomes, right? Uh, pr protects you against catastrophic risk. Uh, you pay the insurance company for coverage for that catastrophic risk. Um, delivery, somebody is actually delivering the care and then payment, payment could be partly you, partly the insurance company. Um, but those are the basic four functions. So your textbook talks about some different kinds of, of uh, uh, national programs for healthcare. So the national health system model is the one that is uh, is the Great Britain example from your textbook. This is taxpayer supported, so everybody pays taxes to finance it. The um, health system is owned and run by the government. So if you go to see your, your family medicine doc, GP they call him, a general practitioner, that person is a government employee um, most of the time. And so, so the government runs the hospitals, they own the hospitals, they own the, they employ the, the physicians. And so they tax you and then they deliver it, deliver the care. There is no insurance function because, uh, and there are no payment systems because you just pay your taxes and get your care for quote, quote unquote free, right? Except that it's, you know, coming out of your taxes. So you have the national health system like the um, uh, British national health system, right? Then you have uh, uh, organ, uh, 
countries that have national health insurance. So in this case, the government funds uh, health care through taxes, so they finance it. Um, and then the government is often the insurer uh, and pays a for private care. Um, uh, so this is the Canadian system. So the financing comes from, you pay taxes into the government. The government functions as both the insurance function and the payment function, but care is actually provided. The delivery is actually done by a private provider who doesn't have much ability to negotiate because the government is a single payer, right? This would kind of be like Medicare for all, uh, as proposed by, say, Elizabeth Warren. Um then you have uh, socialized health insurance. So socialized health insurance is a little bit different. The government doesn't tax and fund the um, uh, uh, and finance, right? Instead, there's a government mandate uh, that either you as an, as an individual or your employer has to pay for your, uh, has to pay for uh, insurance for you. Insurance is then, um, so uh, uh, often the government decides who can, you know, which insurers get to exist. Uh, they grant them regional monopolies. So this is the German system. Um, and uh, basically they have a, you know, they have a monopoly. They're the only insurance game in town or, or the primary insurance game in town. Um, and so they provide insurance and payment and then healthcare is delivered by a private provider. Uh, and government still kind of exercises overall function. So these are different examples of national systems. So the first one is the most kind of fully run by the government. The, you know, so this is the British system. Every, you know, everything is quote free because you've already paid for it with your taxes. Um, and it is, you know, uh, the government collects taxes and then runs the system. It's, you know, run like the DMV. Um, then you have national health insurance, which is basically a healthcare mandate, something like what the ACA was trying to do, where you the government doesn't pay for it, um, but you have to you have to buy health insurance and you have to buy it from an approved provider. Germany does this, Singapore does this quite well, um, and then care and then care is provided by private providers. And then the last version um, is. Uh, 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 government mandate, um, uh, insurance, you know, purchased again. Um, sorry, I mixed that up. Uh, government, <laughs> the government pays for the insurance in, in the NHI version. All right. I back, let me back up. I apologize. I'm trying to do a quick review and I, 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 I talked social insurance instead of national. All right. So one more time, national health system fully run by the government from financing through to delivery. National health insurance, the insurance is funded through taxes. So this would be like Medicare for all or the government option that, that uh, Biden talked about. Uh, but care is provided by private insurers. This is the Canadian system. And then finally, the German or Singaporean system is socialized health insurance, where the government basically mandates that you have to buy insurance. They tell you who you have to buy it from, um, but you get to get your care delivered by provide, private providers. Okay. So um, as a healthcare leader myself in the past, all right, it's really important to understand all these different elements. The United States does not have one of these systems, right? Um, so it's important to understand how it, how is care financed? How is care uh, insured? How is care delivered? And then how is care paid for? Um, so, and then to close the ACA, we'll be talking more about the ACA, but the big goal of the ACA was to increase healthcare and make it more affordable, largely by increasing the role of government uh, in, in the delivery, uh, in, the, in the financing, payment, and delivery of healthcare. So we'll talk a lot more about the ACA as we go forward. Okay, so that's, that's the lecture one, um, and we will uh, continue. Uh, uh, our discussion of healthcare with lecture two.